Hello, good morning. How are you? We're off to work again. Hi ho, hi ho. Actually, I'm really early today. It's only half seven. Don't normally leave till quarter past eight. I've got so much video editing to do. No, I thought I'd get a thought I'd knock a couple out before I started work. Yes, yes, yes. So I well, trust you're well. Business is still going well. We're expected to uh, announce that we're in a recession in the third quarter today. They always do that funny, they have that funny phrase and they say, figures due to be released today, I expected to show, and you're like, really? How do you know what they're expected to show? It's because you've got them already. You've got them already and they're embargoed, let's say, till nine o'clock. You're not allowed to say that figures show until nine o'clock. So what you do is you get round the embargo by saying, figures are expected to show. <coughs> so... Whenever you hear that, you know that not only have people been given the figures ahead of the embargo so in order to prepare a response, but they've also been like, tacitly got permission to announce them up to 24 hours early. And that was one of the problems we had of the GDPA, was that the uh, Department of Health, uh, whenever there was a big announcement, they used to give it to the BDA in advance, and the BDA had plenty of time to work up a response. And they used to give it to the BBC in advance, because the BBC gets everything in advance. And they were, you know, they announced it a day before the result. And um, they didn't give it to the GDPA, because we were political enemies and disapproved of what they were doing and used to tell them what they were doing was wrong and stupid and dumb, which it was. But they didn't want us to be able to come out uh, hit, you know, hit the ground running and, and go on about what a dumb idea it was they'd just come out with. So they used to withhold it from us. And then by the time, you know, so you'd get the press ringing up and saying, uh, what do you think about these uh, figures that are due to come out tomorrow? And you're like, well, we haven't seen them. And they were like, well, we can't send them to you. You know, that's part of the agreement is that we don't send them to anyone. They're embargoed. And you used to think, well, how embargoed are they? You know, they're not that embargoed, are they? <laughs> so... Yeah, so we're going into a recession, apparently. But dentistry is, of all the uh, professions I know, it's one of the most resilient because people always, uh, uh, you know, they can't do their own teeth. They, uh, and they're always getting toothache. And thanks to the mismanagement on the National Health Service, we, we have now got a very a vast and deep, reservoir of people with rotten teeth who are going to blow up like grenades uh, you know every day a few blow up and have to find a dentist urgently because they've got they can't chew on both sides now they can manage not chewing on one but they can't chew on both or Sorry, they've got some stuff in there that I want and they burn it all, which is really annoying. Uh, one day I'll uh, go in there, perhaps this afternoon I'll pop in and ask me if I can have, there's only old crates and stuff like that, but we use it, we, we put the wood in it. And uh, and uh, the, so the wood dries out nicely because it's in like a wooden box. Otherwise we have to put it in builder's bags, which is not so good. I mean, it works, but it's just more awkward. Yeah, so dentistry is very inflation uh, and uh, recession resistant. Inflation resistant because we can set our own fees, uh, at least you can in the private sector. And uh, on the capitation schemes, if you're on a private capitation, you can set your own capitation fees, uh, which I talked about yesterday uh, or in the last video. And uh, the, um, 
we're recession resistant because although we may get we may do less in the way of like fissure sealing or uh, um, sort of uh, cosmetic crowns and stuff like that or filling gaps with bridges we're always going to be doing uh, root treatments and extractions for people who've got toothache so I had a uh, lady in yesterday, a very nihilistic type of patient. You know, oh, I've, everything always goes wrong with my teeth. I've had four sets of dentures, blah, blah, blah. And uh, looking at things through the, the prism of someone, a black prism, you know. She said her upper denture was loose. Just turn that down a bit. And sure enough, her upper denture was loose. But then, you know, I mean, when when do you find an upper denture that isn't loose? So I said to her, let me just turn the lights on. It's getting really dark. I said, to her, well, try a few bits and pieces with your dentures because there, there are about ten. There are about ten rules for making a retentive full upper denture. Uh, which, you know, you only learned if you were in dentistry in the 70s and the 80s when 30% uh, of your patients had full dentures. And it's very rare to find a, a full denture that conforms to the accepted wisdom regarding how they should be made. Uh, the biggest and the most egregious mistake is to put the palate further forward than it needs to be, the, the post dam or even put a post dam on it. And the uh, the reason is that the uh, patients say, you are, I don't want a denture that goes too far back. And so the dentist then puts the post dam too far forward, you know, assuming the patient then accepts that they're not gonna get any retention. And uh, then they glue it in. And then eventually uh, the dentist just, and certainly the technicians are, the most guilty of this, they just put the post dam in the wrong place. They just put it further forward than it needs to be because um, that's what some patients want and so it's lowest common denominator. They figure that if it's good enough for the fussy patients then, then presumably it's all right for everybody. And what happens is that the posterior edge of the denture, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, ends up going across the bony roof of the mouth where you're not going to get any seal as opposed to the beginning of the soft part of the back of the mouth where you might get, uh, conceivably, you might get a little bit of suction. So I said to her, I would extend the post dam. And, and again, I just want to emphasize that I don't use post dams. These dentists who get a wax knife out and carve a five millimeter groove across the palate and, and process acrylic into it, not doing anybody any favors. So, uh, you know, a, a denture works the same with or without this dam construction on the back edge. So I've had to persuade my dentist out of putting post, my, my technician out of putting post dams on. Anyway, so we extended the post dam back and uh, generally sort of relined it, made it fit better. And also, so, so it fits like a new denture now. And also, when I took the impression, I noticed that the flanges on the front of the denture were poking through the impression. And so that then, if you're looking at it, you know, if you're looking at it and thinking, oh, that's great, I've got the impression done, who's in next? Then you're not gonna see this sort of stuff. But if you're looking at it from the, with a clinician's eye, you're gonna see that it's possibly overextended under her lip. So, what happens was, she's lost her teeth a long time ago, so her central frena is attached to the crest of the uh, bridge in, in her upper central areas. So, just looking at the traffic because it's acting a bit strangely. There's someone there I would expect to have overtaken me who's just tucked himself in behind me. So, like all good spy films, I'm always watching out to see if I've been tailed. 
Right, it's entertaining me, that is a bit obvious, I've got to say. So, so what's happening? Another reason why her denture's unstable is because every time she moves her upper lip, it bashes into these flanges and pushes the front of the denture down. And this is you know, it's, it's quite funny when you fix this because what you do is I'm putting more denture on at the back and I'm taking denture away at the front, right? So I took it through to the lab and I trimmed the front flanges down. And that's a little psychological trick, which again, I'm happy to pass on. We have got a lab, well, I say a lab, but we've got a little room around the corner that's got a Dremel in it and a vacuum cleaner and, um, uh, you know, a bit of sandpaper and all the usual dab bits. And um, so we take the denture away and do the adjustment and bring it back. And you'll see this in opticians. <clears throat> they won't do the adjustment in front of you. They'll take it out the back and do it. And then five minutes later, they'll bring it back. And to a certain extent, there's the, the, the amount of time you take is critical because if you take it away for 10 seconds and bring it back, the patient will think that you haven't really done much to it and they'll be correct. They, they might even think that you've just taken it out the back, tapped your foot a couple of times and just brought it back the same. Then that's not good. So what you do is you take it out the back and then you, <coughs> you um, spend about three or four minutes out the back with it. And uh, ideally, accompanied by some hammering and some banging and some drilling noises, which... Um, let's just get out in front of it. Yeah, and uh, you know, within earshot of the patient, so they, I mean, they don't know that you're drilling the denture. I mean, you could just be out there just having a cup of tea with uh, your foot on the motor, but uh, you know, that's. Uh, I mean, they can tell that you're doing something, and I mean, it's much better for them to think that you're taken out to some sort of dedicated facility for denture adjustment, rather than them think that. Uh, rather than see you carve it up in front of their very eyes you know they don't it's not good for a patient to say well i'm going to take this highly accurate impression of your mouth and it's going to fit like new and then see you hacking chunks off it in front of them you know going all over the all over the floor so and then uh, and also it gives you a chance to look at it under a decent light we've got i mean i've got a spotlight out the back it's one of those handheld carbon arc lights, and it's if anything, it's a bit too bright to be honest. It does uh, hurt your eyes if you um, after a while. But uh, I'll tell you the uh, visibility that you get when you when you do something under a really really good light, a really strong light, especially at, at my age. Uh, you you can do some. You'll do your best work. You'll do your best work of your career under really really strong lighting you'll see things that you never saw before you'll uh, polish bits you never polished before you know you'll see rough patches that you never saw before so hello mr audi somewhere in a hurry there's traffic lights up here i don't know what he's gonna do So anyway, we brought it all back, and then she was like, mm, oh yeah, yeah, it does seem to be staying up better. And um, the other thing is that, uh, don't be afraid to say, do you want me to glue it in for you? Because, you know, the days when we used to say, oh yeah, we're so brilliant, we can make your full dentures that are completely uh, brilliant in appearance, in bite, retention, and stability, are gone. You know, we, we've ceased that BS. Uh, we know, you know, I always say to people that dentures are not a substitute for your teeth. They're just the next best thing to having no teeth. They just enable you to try and chew of something. Look at this. Someone's house is on the move. They've chosen a good time to do it, haven't they, rush hour? So, you know, I always say to the patients, look, you know, these are, these are new. 
you're not familiar with them again. They're like, it's like a new set. Your tongue's not going to know where to go. Your cheeks are going to keep bashing them out all the way. Um, do you want me to, just to get you through the first couple of hours or days, do you want me to stick some glue on just to help you out? And nine times out of ten, they'll say, yeah, good idea. Uh, because they're used to gluing them in themselves anyway. You know, they know dentist uh, plus glue equals smiley face. So the glue I use is a uh, Wernis, Ultra Wernis, and it's a powder. And uh, the good thing about it being a powder is that um, it's not fully hydrated when you put it on the denture. You can you, you wet the denture and you sprinkle it on and then you just put it in the mouth. And then what happens is it just gradually absorbs moisture from the mouth. And the more moisture it absorbs, the more glue gets formed. So in fact, it's... Um, uh, retention is maintained, you know, you can get a decent amount. And also the retention is very good. So, yeah, so we pack people off with um, Wernis on. No, I mean, if necessary, if it's a partial and they're clipped in okay, then we don't bother. Anyway, you know, having done this reline and and a reline and adjustment on the anterior flanges this the whole point was that that is not the whole treatment plan the treatment plan is to try and now tackle the lower denture which is a lower full on two implants which she claims are unretentive and uh cost her seven thousand pounds and she keeps going on this cost me seven thousand pounds i paid seven thousand pounds for this you know and I'm like, and I eventually I said to her, well, you didn't pay me £7,000 for it, did you? You know, so just shut up about it. I mean, I know, you know, you paid £7,000 for it, and then your, your, her attitude, her outlook is causing her to think, well, this is, you know, this was a loss. This was just a write-off. But um, when we finally did this thing to the denture, the upper denture, a flicker, I... I I can't be sure, I can't say positively, but it just appeared to me for a fraction of a second that the thought of a flicker of a smile might have come to her face. And she might have had to admit at last that some dentist has, has made the situation better and therefore as a result might actually know what he's talking about and as a result might actually be able to do something for her. So, <clears throat> but that, you know, I mean, what I've described to you there is all about the personal side of the relationship, isn't it? It's all about the psychological, the psychology of dentistry. I mean, any idiot can do a reline. Any idiot can follow a book on how to construct dentures. But to psychologically manage that patient, by following all my rules of, you know, make it quite clear to the patient that you've got enough business as it is, you don't have to take them on. And that uh, if they don't want you to do anything, then that's fine, you'll quite happily not do anything because you've, you've got other stuff, you know, you've got other business. And uh, if they are not impressed, then you don't care because it's not your job to impress them. You know, that they, are the ones with the problem. You don't have the problem. You come to work quite happy, you go home quite happy. They're the ones who are miserable. They've got the problem. And that what you'll do is you will, because you're a nice person, you will try and help them. If they're capable of being helped, and if they're not capable of being helped, then, then there's no point, and you might as well not bother. And this is, <clears throat> you know, and so this, uh, I don't care, attitude, is, works really well. It, it resets the relationship. It normalises it. it. It sets it off on the correct footing. You know, not, uh, oh yeah, we can do this, we can do that. Oh yeah, I'm sure we can achieve this where no one else has ever achieved it before. You know, and but what you have to do is you have to show to the, you have to demonstrate to the patient that you can walk the walk. You can, when you say 
you're going to do something that you can do it and, and it will have the effect that you describe. Now in her case this denture was a test as I say. It was probably the simplest and easiest way just to find out whether she's complete nihilist or whether she um, or whether she's just is depressed and fed up about being old and not having any teeth and 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 as a result looks at everything through a negative lens and nothing you ever do is going to be is, is going to be satisfactory and I think she passed the test in so far as um, you know she did I think she would grudgingly admit and perhaps you know I mean she may be she may be first person who rings this morning and says they're absolutely no better Mr Watson they're absolutely in fact if anything they're worse and then I'll say all right well fine I'm sorry we couldn't help you I'm certainly not going to touch her implants if that's that but if she says actually no since you did that bit of work on those top she stayed up a lot better and how can you get them to stay up even better and I'll say well we could perhaps put a couple of implants up the top but you know that's uh, that's the most I can do with your full dentures anyway without implants do you know what I mean this is what I'm saying the days when we just used to do dentures are gone the days now if someone says I need lower full dentures you say well basically what you need is what you're asking me to do is lower full dentures on the implants but without the implants okay I'll um I'll talk to you soon bye